Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our SIGUX webinar. My name is uh, Lori Fox and I am the current chair of the SIGUX Executive Committee and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Beth Lynn Nolan who is going to talk to us about posters. But before I turn you over to the master poster creator, I have a little bit of news that I want to share with you. We have one more webinar left in our series before the SIGUX 2018 conference, and that is our SIGUX 2018 First Timers webinar. That's going to be held um, five weeks from today. I think it's five weeks on September 27th. Um, we have a team that will present that to us. Registration is open for the conference, and we actually uh, just in the last few weeks have added a lot more information about the conference, including um, all of the information about the schedule and the speakers and the special events that are going on. So I encourage you to go look at that. Our keynote speakers are Jeffrey Salingo and Geraldine Fitzpatrick. We are looking forward to hearing both of their topics. And there still is time to sign up for pre-conference seminars. The business behind the magic seminar currently is full, but we did start a waiting list. And if we get 10 more people signed up, we will um, be able to register all of them. Disney uh, wants us to register people in uh, specific increments. So if you're interested in that, you can get on the waiting list. We also have a seminar on being an inspirational leader. Uh, one on project management, and one on pursuing diversity, equity, inclusion. So those are some fantastic seminars that are offered on Sunday afternoon. Uh, the conference officially opens Monday morning, but Sunday we do have a few events, and there still is time to sign up for those. The hotel deadline is approaching. September 7th is the last day that we can guarantee you can get the rates that we agreed to with Disney. Um, we are going to be staying at the Coronado Springs Resort, which uh, gives us all of the amenities of staying at a Disney resort, including Magical Express from the airport. That makes airport, um, airport driving uh, non-existent. You really can just um, zoom right to the hotel. They even bring your luggage for you. So that's fantastic. Um, Registration is open. I also want to remind you that you can join SIGUX. The membership benefits include conference discounts on the conference and on the pre-conference seminars. Um, you can have access to the ACM Digital Library. I was actually just out there earlier this week looking up um, information on a project that I'm working on, and I went out and found a paper um, from someone that did a similar project at another college. You can also participate in the SIGUX Mentoring Program. The SIGUX Mentoring Program um, is an opportunity for you to be paired one-on-one -on -one with someone else in the SIGUX community. Uh, the Mentoring Program, uh, we take applications starting right after the annual conference, and then each cohort runs from approximately January to October. You can stay in touch with the SIGUX organization by um, joining our email listserv or um, online in the Facebook community and Twitter. So now I'm going to change presenter to Beth. Um, Beth Lynn Nolan was one of our um, communication award winners last year, and she is also uh, really an expert at creating uh, compelling, attractive, informative posters. So we invited her to um, share with you all of her tips. Um, Beth, are you okay if um, someone asks me a question during the... Um... Oh, sorry, Alan, I had the wrong mode there. During the presentation, if I interrupt you and ask... Yep, I am perfectly Ask fine with that. Question. Okay, good. Um, so if 
uh, anyone wants to ask a question during the presentation, you can just type in the questions mode. Um, Beth, I'm going to mute myself just so you can't hear me breathing or typing. Mm -hmm. Before and, you do that, I just yes. want to double check what screen are you seeing? Are you seeing space or are you seeing the poster slide? Space. Okay, I, I need to switch my things around. Hold on one moment. I am still getting used to GoToWebinar, so I've just got to do a slight bit of rearranging here. And then I should be good to go. Thank you for your patience. And come on, start the slideshow. Oh, hold on. It's trying to start the slideshow on the other screen. Which okay. Is <laughs> oh, computer. Well, I'm you using two monitors right now. <laughs> I did the same thing too, so. Yeah, let's see here. What are you doing? Are you actually, I'm just going to start PowerPoint over and see if that happens. Let's okay. see if that will help. And we'll trim all of this up, Beth. It's the beauty of yeah. technology. Indeed. Let me sort all of my icons because I apparently lost my present. There we go. Poster creation. And, oh, hold on. Let me see if I can tell it to switch what screen is showing. I apologize. Let me see here. Show. Screen of monitor one. All right, now do we see? Now we see it. Hooray! I had to tell it monitor one, which was kind of not exactly intuitive because I would think monitor one would be my laptop monitor and not the external monitor. But computers, okay. they are. Yeah. So I'm going to make myself, but I will pop mm -hmm. in if we get a question. All righty then. So hello everybody, as Lori said, my name is Beth and I am with IT training at Indiana University. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to create an effective poster for presentation at the Sagux poster session at this con at this year's conference. Yeah, at this year's conference. <laughs> you might recognize this poster that's over here, the Creating Research Posters poster. That was one of the ones that I put together for last year's conference. And I really enjoy making research posters. It's it's a combination of two things that I really enjoy doing: design and research. So I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through the process of putting together a research poster, introduce you to some th some things that will help you in the poster creation process, and then give you some tips to get started. First off, before I go any further. For those of you who are here that are presenting a poster or at, as part of the general poster session or if you've won a communication award, congratulations. So hopefully you guys will have this post, this session will be helpful to you and hopefully making a poster will be a little less scary at the end of this because sometimes poster making can be intimidating. I remember my first time making a poster for a graduate class and the professor gave us very vague instructions. He just told us what size it needed to be and then it had to have at least two graphs. The rest was up to us. And so I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to include on it, but since I've made many more posters since then, I've got I've got a much better idea of what goes on a research poster. So you might think, well, what do I need to get a poster? What do I what do I need to make a research poster? How do I get started? Well, the first thing you're going to need is your poster's text. So for those of you who submitted a poster presentation proposal, you're already going to have a starting point for your poster's text. If you've already written that four page paper and you've got an idea of what you wanna talk about, with that, you'll just wanna condense down what you wrote for your paper into some text for your poster. For those of you who are communication awards winners, you'll wanna write up something about your winning item. It doesn't have to be terribly long. You don't have to write something research paper length. Just tell us about your winning item. How did you make it? What was it? How was it received? Things like that. Next, you'll wanna include images. Images can involve screenshots, um, they can involve photos, graphs of any data that you might have, anything that's going to help you tell the story that your poster is trying to share. So you need text, you need images, and the last and actually the, one of the more important things you'll need for making a research poster is a page layout program of some sort. Now, you can use Adobe InDesign or Illustrator to make a poster, and you could even use my 
you can even use Microsoft PowerPoint in a pinch. It's not the best program for making posters, but you can make a poster in PowerPoint. So once you've got your text and your images, now you might think, okay, I've got this, but how do I get started? What do I do? Well, I've got four steps that you can take to get on the road to poster creation. First off, well, familiarize yourself with some design principles that will help you make an engaging poster and an interesting looking poster. Next, you'll want to collect your text and images if you haven't done so already. Third, you'll want to sketch out a rough layout of your poster and then also decide on colors and fonts that you might want to use in your poster. And then last, but certainly not least, you're going to want to lay out your poster, build it in your, po in your page layout program, and then print it. Now, I'll be walking you through these steps briefly today, but if you want to learn more about these steps, I'm going to send out, I'm going to share at the end of today's session a link to the course Creating Research Posters, which has all of this information, but expanded even more. So that way, anytime you need a refresher on this, it's all there waiting for you. So we're going to talk first about some design principles for effective posters. But before we get into those design principles and before we get into, um, before you get started with making your poster, you're going to want to think about two very important things. First is your audience or who's reading your poster. And then the second is your message or what you're trying to tell your audience. These two things are going to influence how you put together your poster, what colors and fonts you use and more. For example, Knowing my audience for last year's poster session is what helped me feel brave enough to do something a little more entertaining with the poster I made for one of my communication award winners last year. That Spaceballs themed poster about creating research posters. I was a little nervous because I thought, well, are they going to receive this well? Should I just make a simple non themed poster? But I asked some friends who'd gone to the Sagux conference in the past and they said, oh, they would love this. So that's how we ended up with creating research posters, the poster. But so think about your audience and think about your message. They're going to govern everything that you include in your poster. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the design principles. We're going to group them into four areas, focus, organization, restraint, and then attention to detail. And so I'm going to touch on these briefly in our webinar today, but there is a long section about each of these in the Creating Research Posters course. So first off, we'll talk about focus. With focus, we're talking about or thinking about contrast and proportion. These are design principles that focus on getting your reader's attention and keeping it on your poster by either by, by including things that are eye catching. So for example, with contrast, you're making parts of your layout stand out from your surroundings using size, using color, using other means, making it stand out. Then proportion is using size to help convey importance. So making the more important items on your page bigger than everything else, and then making the smaller items on your page, the, making the less important items on your page a little smaller. So I've got some visual examples of how this might work with a research poster that I've put together in the past. It's not the most flashy research poster, but we've got some examples of, one example of adding some contrast is in our headings, in our title. We can make our, we wanna make our title catch everybody's eye. So that's going to be the largest text on our poster, the title of our poster. And also you can incorporate some contrast and make use of proportion here in the, sub, in the subheadings that are in your body text. So you can see not only is this bigger than the surrounding body text, it's also got some color in it to help it stand out, to help indicate, okay, we're kind of changing topics here. This is a new section and then tell them what it's about. So we've got some examples of proportion, proportion and contrast. And then one other piece of contrast is with our text boxes here, these quotes that are from feedback from that we'd received from participants in this study. In order to help them stand out from the surrounding text, we added a colored background to them and also changed the font as well to help them stand out a little bit more and make it, make it obvious that this is something a little different than the rest of the body text. So, and to help get your reader's attention, to help get them to focus on your poster, Think about contrast and proportion. Think about making things stand out on your poster and making your more important items larger so they catch your reader's eye. 
Next, I'm going to talk about organization, how we put items on our page. And when we're thinking about organization, we're thinking about direction and proximity. So direction is just how we lead how we lead our readers through the page using visual stepping stones these visual stepping stones can be pictures they can be subheadings they can be fields of they can be um, text boxes with color behind them anything that catches your reader's eye and then proximity it's just grouping our related items together so things make sense so i'm going to have an example up here and we're going to think about direction and how our eyes are led through this poster. Now we've got our image here that catches our eye and a little bit of text and then it's drawn down into this other cat picture here and then we're pulled over to these graphs and then pulled into these images here. And so as our eyes are bouncing around from image to image, from chart to chart, from eye-catching item to eye-catching item, our eyes are going to be drawn through that poster. And as we're there drawn through the poster, we're going to be reading the poster text and learning about the research that people want to share. So there are a couple of different ways you can lay out items or a couple of different shapes. This one is an example of almost an example of a Z shape almost. It's like a Z shape with a little extra but um, you want you can have them in diagonal lines or straight lines of any type, the Z shape, and another shape that you can use is the C. So you have something over here in the upper right corner and then leads everybody around through here. There are some shapes you might want to avoid, like the circle. If you put everything around the outside of your poster and then include important information in the middle, people might miss things. And so make sure you're conscious of where things, where you're leading your reader through the page. And then thinking about organization, we want to make sure with, with organization and proximity, we want to make sure that we're grouping our related items together. And so this example here shows our graphs that are obviously grouped with the results section because they're demonstrating results of a research study. Now, if we'd incorporated these results charts elsewhere, like if I'd put this at the beginning here, people might be a little confused as to why it's there. They might say, well, this doesn't really make sense with what's going on in this paragraph. So we want to make sure that our related items are grouped together so that way things make sense on our poster. One of the things to keep in mind with when you're making a poster for a poster presentation at a conference or a research poster is that you're not always going to be there by your poster for people to help guide people through your poster. So you want to lay things out in a way that people can follow through things in a way that makes sense. And that way they can go through the poster on their own without getting lost. Because I know I'm going to want to go around and look at all sorts of awesome posters. So. Beth, I have two questions for you. Alrighty. <laughs> and I'm going to ask them in the reverse order they came in. The first okay. one is, how many is a good number of photos? Is it possible to have too many? And the second question is, this might you might be covering this, but do you have tips on how to condense from a four-page paper down to a poster? All right. So to answer the first question... There is a such thing as too many images, but I don't know, I can't think of off the top of my head a concrete number of images you should limit yourself to. I would say add some images to your poster, step back, take a look at it, and if it starts to look a little crowded, like this one looks like it might be getting a little crowded, then maybe rearrange things, remove an image or two and see how things go. But I definitely wouldn't, so this has six images in it. I don't think I'd go for more than six images because that could get a little overwhelming. And then for the second question, we do actually, I will go over how to condense all of that text into something a little bit more research poster worthy. So no worries, you're on top of things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so we've talked about um, we've talked about focus, we've talked about organization. Now we're going to talk about restraint. And that actually kind of ties into that question we had about taking our four page research paper down to poster size. And when we're thinking about restraint, we want to avoid including too many eye catching items on a page, as it might end up distracting the reader from your message. That also ties into the images question, too. 
So when we're thinking about restraint, we want to avoid having a poster that looks like this. We want to limit our font choices, limit our color choices, limit the amount of text we have on our poster. Um, so for, for poster text, I have heard between 600 to 800 words for poster text um, as a maximum. I have also heard maybe do less. Um, somebody I talked to today actually said, no, you should do 400 words on a poster. Less is more. But I wouldn't go any more than having 800 words on a paper, on a poster, I mean. So the less words you use, the more likely people are going to, it'll catch their eye and then say, oh, I don't have a wall of text to read through. So I can, so they can skim through it, see if it's something they wanna know more about. And then if it is, they can come up and read through the whole poster or ask you questions. And again, for limiting, you wanna limit your color and font choices. You'll wanna to stick to two different fonts. Um, so one font for your headings and one font for your body text and then two or three colors at most. This one, I've got one, two, three, I've got one, two, three different colors in the headings alone, and then I've got another color up here at the top, and then I've got this gradient background and all sorts of things. Somebody decided to use Comic Sans font in this. That's, a, that's, that's not suggested for research posters, but yeah, you wanna make sure that while you have eye-catching items on your page, don't go overboard with them. If your page starts to look crowded, if it starts to look like you're trying to cram too many things in there, and you might have to go to somebody else to say, okay, how's my poster looking? Does this look a little bit too crowded? Does this look overwhelming? Getting somebody else's, somebody else's viewpoint on a poster can be really helpful. So, but exercising restraint is one of the more important things for research poster creation. This, one of my posters from last year's communication awards, I did not stick to the 800 word limit. I kind of went a little crazy with my poster design and it was fun and people said, oh yeah, I like this. But more people came to the shorter poster, to the creating research posters poster because it had less text on it and asked me questions about that instead of the other poster that I'd put together. So yeah, we wanna exercise restraint with our posters. Next, we're going to talk about paying attention to detail. There are a couple of areas where we'll pay attention to detail is text, images, and alignment. Now, paying attention to detail in your, lay in your layout is going to help give your poster a polished and professional look and feel. So first, we're going to focus on text details. So remember how I mentioned you'd like, you should probably stick to using two different fonts in your poster and one for your body text and one for your headings? Well, to help you make to help you narrow down your decisions a little bit more it's it's good to use serif fonts for your body text and sans serif for your heading text now serif text has a little flag serif fonts have the little flags on the end of each stroke of the letter and that makes it easier to figure out for our eyes to figure out our letters when they're smaller when there's a large amount of body text that might be in small print. Our eyes can pick out each letter a little bit better and, and process each word. Now with sans serif, it doesn't have the flags on the end of each stroke, as you can see here, and they work pretty well for headings and subheadings. Not only that, if you're using a serif font and a sans serif font in combination, that adds some contrast to help think, to help your headings stand out from the rest of your body text. So that's one way we can add contrast without even really being aware of it. Another thing that we want to make sure that we do is to proofread and spell check. It's important to make sure you haven't misspelled any words or aren't like, for example, words that might be spelled correctly but used in the wrong context. It's important to check that before we print our poster, before everything is finished. So you can spell check in InDesign. InDesign does have a spelling checker, which is really awesome. You can do your spell checking in PowerPoint. I have not explored to see if Illustrator does spell checking. Illustrator is more towards graphic design as opposed to print layout. But you might, in that case, you might type up your poster text in Word and then bring it into your page layout program of choice. And we all know Word has a spell checker. Next, we're gonna focus on images. You want to make sure your images are print ready before you pay before you put them into your poster. 
Now that means checking to make sure that your images are the correct resolution for print before you put them into your poster. And if your poster, if your images for your poster aren't the right resolution, you'll end up with something pixelated. Like over here, we've got we've got dark helmet, president screw, all pixelated. That's not what we want. You can see here down here, our text is nice and clear, but everything else is all pixelated. So we want to make sure that we've got high resolution images that are going to print nicely. And there is a section of creating research posters that actually walks you through the process of checking the resolution of your images. So seeing how big they will be when they print. And also, if necessary, changing that resolution within reason. You can tweak the resolution if you have a really large image that has a low resolution. You can high, you can raise the resolution and then make the image a little bit smaller in the process. But then it will print more nicely. It'll print, it'll look less pixelated. It'll less, look less like it belongs on a Nintendo game and more like it belongs on your poster. All righty. Oh, come on, PowerPoint, what are you doing? The next detail we're going to focus on is alignment. We want to make sure that our page elements are lined up with each other. Now, here's an example of that cat research poster that I showed earlier where things are a little off. Things look a little messy. We've got pic some pictures here that don't line up with the edges of the columns. We've got jumping horizons here is a term that I've heard because all of the columns don't start at the top at the same point. And if you see here with these lines that I've drawn at the sides of each uh, at the sides of each column, you can see things are not lined up at all. So we want to make sure that things are neatly lined up. It's going to show that you pay that extra attention to detail, and it's going to show that you've put that put that extra effort to make sure things are nice and neatly lined up. Now, page layout programs can help you with this. InDesign, Illustrator, and PowerPoint will allow you to turn on grids that will help you precisely align objects on your page. The grid in PowerPoint isn't quite the greatest. It has really big grid squares, but you can have, you can adjust the size of your grid squares in Illustrator and InDesign to be the size that you want. And I see a green microphone. Yeah, that's me. From Lori. Oh, you're so sweet. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> you know I have this question, but I have this question too. I don't okay. know InDesign or Illustrator. That what, is okay. What do I lose using PowerPoint? Will my poster suffer? Well, one of the big things about trying to make a poster in PowerPoint is that PowerPoint doesn't have text wrap around images. There's ways to um, there's ways to kind of make it look like you're wrapping text around images, but it can be a little fiddly. So if you have pictures that are the width of your column, that's perfectly fine. You can stretch, you can make sure that your images are a good size, that they'll fit neatly in your column, and then just have text go above and below them. Or if you want to get if you want to do fiddly, if you want to play with the text and break it up into multiple text boxes then and have text that wraps around images, you can do that in PowerPoint, but it's a little fiddly. But that's one of the things that you lose when working with, when making a research poster in PowerPoint. There are a couple of other things that I've noted in the Creating Research po Posters course that I can bring up after we're finished with the with the presentation here, just to check and see, because I know there's a list of things. Because it's, okay. yeah, PowerPoint, while you can use it for page layout, and I have used it for page layout, sometimes it's not the best tool. Thank you. Yep, you are very welcome. Alrighty, so we've ta talked about paying attention to detail, we've talked about exercising restraint, so now we're ready to collect the text and images for a poster. So if you haven't already written the text for your poster or or have an idea or you, if you have have a rough idea but haven't written it yet, you'll want to treat your poster your poster text like an extended and structured abstract. 800 words or less. In fact, as I've said, as I've said previously, less is better. I might aim, like for my research poster that I'm working on, I'm actually going to aim for 600 words. So that way, again, people can skim the poster, catch what they catch and see if they want to read more about it or come and ask you questions. And for 
poster sessions, there's nothing saying that you can't bring a full version of your poster text with you. Say you've won a communications award and you just go to town writing all about this amazing project that you've done and you realize you went way over with your word count. Maybe you've got 1,200 words. Well, you can save that and print it and hand it out at the poster session, but trim down that text to 600 to 800 words. That'll be enough to to help get people interested in your topic. And if they come to you and ask for more information, then you can say, oh, hey, I have this extended version of my research poster. You can take this with you if you want. So you don't need, so if you're, so you don't need to include everything on your poster, every tiny detail. Just summarize and talk about the most important points. So for those of us who have pre are presenting as part of the poster session and have written that four page paper, that's already going to be in the ACM li digital library. So we can direct people to that to read our posters. So they've done that work for us. Now um, for images, for your poster images, you wanna make sure that the resolution is high enough to print well, as I said previously. Your images should be at a, at a resolution of 150 dots per inch minimum. So that dots per inch means how many spots of color in a square inch will print on a sheet of paper. The more of those dots per inch per square, per, the more of those dots per inch of paper, they'll, they'll be packed more densely together and we won't be able to look at that and you know resolve each of those little spots of color into a spot of color. It'll all resolve into an image. You'll notice that sometimes if you've printed pictures off the web, they look a little grainy. That's because most web images are only at a resolution of 72 dots per inch. So they don't pack those little spots of color in quite as closely. Now, as I've mentioned earlier, if you have a big image with a low resolution, you can bump up the resolution within reason. If you bump up the resolution a bit and then it ends up being too small, like it's it's going to come out like maybe an inch by an inch on your poster, something tiny, you might want to th think about finding another image to use instead of the one that you're working with. And make sure you've got that tech, those text and the text and your images together before you start making your poster. The next thing we're going to do is talk about planning your layout. Hey, hold the on. First thing, I'm sorry, oh, Beth. Yeah. I just, uh, is there a maximum resolution, like to keep your um, file size smaller? I wouldn't go higher than 300 dots per inch, because if you go higher than that, then, um, especially if you're including a fair number of images in your poster, then that'll make your poster file size bigger and it'll take a little longer to print. Um, I know that poster, not poster, that um, like photo printers print at 600 DPI and they're just printing on small pieces of paper. So that doesn't take that right. long. But if, if you have four pictures at 600 DPI, that's gonna take a while. So I wouldn't go any higher than 300. And do you have a favorite picture source? I use Google Images a lot. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I will set it to, um, in fact, let me pull up my internet browser here and bring it on the screen here. You'll see a tiny preview of something else. If I go to images.google.com and I'll search for cats. And then if you go into the set, into the tools here, you can choose usage rights that are labeled for reuse, labeled for non-commercial reuse. So that way you make sure that you're not taking somebody's picture that they might, for example, want, that, that they might charge money for, or it's something that they've taken that they consider some of their own artwork. And so they might not necessarily want you running off with their images. So I tend to go with, non-commercial reuse or non-commercial reuse with modification, which means you can make some changes to the image. And then once you select that, it'll show you pictures that are that are free for you to use. And just if, so, like, if you go to a website, if you go to the picture's website, it might say, please give me credit if you use, your, use this image. And then you can just include that image at the very bottom of your poster, or that credit, I mean. But yeah, Google Images is where I tend to get some of my get most of my images. Sometimes I will also, depending on the topic, I'll also take my own pictures. And for when I'm 
when I'm creating other content that's not necessarily a research poster, I tend to use my own po pictures because it's just easier to use pictures of my cats because I know my cats won't sue me for using right. my pictures. Thank you. <laughs> yep, you are welcome. All right, so we want to sketch out a rough plan for your poster's layout before you even open up PowerPoint or Illustrator or InDesign. So this is the rough sketch. It's not even entirely finished. I just got an idea of where I wanted to go and then just kind of stopped before I finished sketching everything out. But this is a rough sketch for the poster that I, one of the posters I put together for last year's Communication Awards. And the sketch is going to help you figure out where you want to go with your poster, how things should be put down on your page, where, do, where pieces of text are going to go, where images might go. And you can do this on a sheet of paper. You could do this on a whiteboard. In fact, if you do it on a whiteboard, it'll be easier to rearrange things as you need to. If you say, okay, well, this isn't looking good. This doesn't really have a nice flow. You can just take the eraser and just wipe stuff off and then rebuild it as you need to. Then once you've got that rough plan for your poster's layout, then you can take that to your page layout program of choice and build your poster. So this is the edited completed version of this poster. I actually went back and edited it down to 800 words. So that way it wasn't such a wall of text. It's still, oh, there's still a lot in there, but it's not as bad as it used to be. But see, we've got our rough roadmap of what I wanted to do. And then here it is in person. You'll also want to choose your fonts and colors ahead of time. So I've got some actually some suggestions for pairs of fonts that you might want to use. These are just suggestions and that way you can kind of see them together. These are sans serif fonts combined with serif fonts. So for example, Helvetica and Garamond or Calibri and Times New Roman. And one thing you can do to just test out different font combinations is just open up Word or open up PowerPoint and just start typing things and styling them with different types of fonts. That way you can get an idea of how they might look together on a poster and see if, say, one font kind of clashes with another or if they don't really go well together. So that's one thing that you can do to help figure out your font choices. With your colors, think you might want to think back to your audience. Think about, well, what kind of group are you presenting to? Well, you're presenting to Sigux folks and we are a lively bunch. So you might be able to use some brighter colors, some more exciting colors than you might if you were presenting at say, if you were presenting say for, um, gosh, I can't, I'm drawing a blank on something boring to present about maybe like an earnings report at a financial meeting. I don't know. That's about as boring as I can. We think had of. a mushroom club here on campus recently. I think that's pretty boring. Yeah, I didn't even. Yeah, I would. Yeah, if you're presenting mm -hmm. something for a mushroom club, I could just see brown, mm -hmm. brown everywhere for your and posters. Yellows, a lot of yellows too. Yeah, yeah, brown and yellow. But yeah, just thinking about your audience and remembering your audience and your message and using that to help pick the colors and the fonts you use. So you might be able to use something a little bit more playful for your fonts and your colors, depending on your audience. Now, let me see here. I've got some additional design tips that'll help you out in the design process. Now, the first thing is to avoid using an image for the background of your poster. Now, if you have like, if you think back to that slide I had where I had the poster that looked like it was on a desk, there's white there's white space behind the text. So that way there's an image for the background, but it's not the, the text is not directly over that image. If you have text directly over an image, it's going to make it hard to read. There might not be enough contrast. It'll be hard for readers to pick out the words of your body text. And it's just, it can, get frustrating and people just say, okay, never mind, I'm not gonna read this poster. You'll also want to avoid using a gradient for the background of your poster. Now, it's not quite the same as with the images. Now, with a gradient, yes, it's just one color to another. And if you've chosen colors that have enough contrast with your body text, you might think, okay, this could work. But when printing your poster, Sometimes gradients will come out with banding. You'll know, you might, like if you're printing something out, say on a black and white printer was one example that I can think of. 
um, you might notice that there are like some kind of stripes between colors where it sort of blends together, but you can kind of see the edges of where one color end starts and ends. I've also seen this happen on large format printers here at IU, where somebody will print something out with a gradient background, or I've included a small gradient in a piece of my background, and I can, see, or not my background, or a piece of my poster, and I can see that little bit of banding, so it's not quite a smooth transition from one color to the next. It, it so that's that is why I would suggest avoid using a gradient for the background of your poster. Now, if you're including graphs in your poster, you wanna make sure that graphs include a title and properly labeled axes. So if you're exporting these from say Microsoft Excel, before you, before you export them as images, make sure that you've gone in and added a title and added data labels too. So that way people can understand the, the story you're trying to tell with your data. That is something that's really important. Otherwise, people will look at this bar chart and say, okay, what does this bar chart represent? Does it represent how many hours a cat played video games or what, how many different video games a cat played? Who knows? And one last thing, keep in mind that colors might look slightly different on your screen than they do when they're printed. I have seen this happen many different times. I'll put something together on my computer, take it to get printed, and then it'll be slightly darker or something, the, some color looks a little different. That's nothing to worry about. Now, if you take something over to get printed and it ends up in it much darker than it should be, which I've also had happen, then there might be a problem with the ink on the printer, there might be something wrong with that with that poster printer, but be prepared for slight differences. Be prepared for things to look a little bit different when they come out printed. Now that you know, now that you've got some design tips, now that you know, okay, I can use these design principles to help lay the pieces out on my poster, and I know that I should sketch out a rough draft and get every all my pieces together. Once you've got all that, once you've done all that, now you can start building your poster. And there are three main programs that people use to make posters. So as I've mentioned them many times, Illustrator, InDesign, and PowerPoint. So PowerPoint, I've, as we discussed a little bit earlier, there are some drawbacks to making posters in PowerPoint, but you can still make some really good looking posters in PowerPoint. I've actually, I've used it to make advertisements for events before. Um, granted, they were not poster sized, they were eight and a half by 11 sized, but you can, you can use PowerPoint to do some pretty good things as long as you know the limitations of PowerPoint and have an idea of how to work around those limitations, how to make PowerPoint do what you want it to do. Now, the first thing you're gonna wanna do when you're building your poster, no matter what, no matter what program you're using, you wanna set your page size to the size that your poster is going to be. This is gonna make sure that it prints properly. Now, if for example, you open up PowerPoint and you just start adding things to a poster, and then you say, all right, my poster is designed, great, I'm gonna have it printed. And you bring it to you bring it to a large format printer and it prints out it'll print out at eight and a half by eleven because you didn't we didn't go in and make sure that our slide size is the right size before printing. And so that's something that's important to do. Otherwise you're gonna end up with tiny posters. Do you recall what Next, the poster Next you'll want to add your content. Sorry, do you recall what the poster size is for SIGUX? I do and they're actually, I think, two slides away. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay, no, it's okay. It's I like it when people are on top of things, so. <laughs> Alrighty, so once you're to the point where you've got your page the right size, now you can add your content. Now, as you're adding your content, this depends on your personal preferences. Me, I like to put my text into my poster first and then add the images and move the text around as I need to to incorporate the images and then do my styling, then make, make everything look pretty. And so if you wanna start with adding images and then work the text around them, that works too. It's just, it's up to you, it's your personal preference. And then once you've got your content added, once you've styled it and included your colors and picked the different fonts and made use of them and added all of your images and everything, then you'll save your file as a PDF to get it ready for printing. Now, you might say, well, why a PDF? Well, when saving a document as a PDF, it's gonna package together all of the images that you use 
any special fonts you're using and any other like any graphs that you've incorporated all the things that you might have pulled in to PowerPoint, to InDesign, to Illustrator, it's going to put them all into one file that you can just pop on a flash drive and bring anywhere to get printed. So you can and you can even tell it print save this as a high quality PDF to make sure everything prints nicely. So once we've done all that, there's a few other design considerations before we actually these are these are for you to keep in mind when you're designing. And here are our display board sizes for our conference. There are three sizes of display boards available for this year's conference. And we've got 20 by 30 inch foam core board, 40 by 60 inch foam core board, and then 36 by 48 inch trifold board. And these boards are gonna be provided at the conference. So there's no need to worry about transporting a giant poster board with you to the conference or running around Orlando trying to find something to mount your poster to. And the poster session chair, Kendra, is going to have more information for poster presenters about shipping or traveling with your posters and assembly at the conference. So keep your eyes out for that email. You also want to make sure that your text can be read from a distance. This might sound like a silly thing to think about. You might say, well, yeah, we're making a poster. The text is going to be big. We should be able to read it from a distance, right? Well, it's good to double check that. One way to check that is to load your poster on your screen make it take up your whole screen and then step four to six feet away of uh, step is it four to six or try it stepping away four four feet away from your computer monitor and see what you can still see if you have a tiny monitor that won't necessarily work very well but if you've got a larger monitor that might be one way of determining if your text is large enough to read from a distance another way to test this out is Print your poster on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. As you're printing it, tell it to scale to the paper size instead of just printing out a chunk of the middle of your poster. And then once it's on that smaller paper size, take it out of the printer, give it a read. And if you can read it, then people should be able to read it when they're standing in front of your poster, maybe at a distance as they're looking around, browsing through the posters at the session. That means they'll be able to read it from a distance. Now, there are a couple of different ways you can print your poster. The traditional format that I've used mostly is on campus. For example, the Wells Library at, the I, at, at Indiana University has some large format printers that we've used to print posters before. My posters for last year's conference were printed at the library. Now, another place you can, another thing you can do is take it to a print shop. There might be local print shops. You could bring it to FedEx Kinko's. You could bring it to Staples and have them print it. It, costs, it might cost a little bit more to do it that way as opposed to going to someplace on campus to get it printed. But you'll know, especially if you don't have a place to print things on campus, then there's options. Or you can do something really different. So what I did with as a test for this year's conference poster is I took one of my poster my posters from last year's conference and printed it on fabric using spoon flower. And I'm actually going to briefly share my webcam here so that way you guys can see what I've got here. So this is my poster. This is my research poster from last year. This is the Spaceballs poster and it's on fabric. What's nice? is I can fold this up and stick it in a carry-on with it being printed on fabric. That's and then amazing. When I want to display it, out it comes. Oops, sorry. This is a 36 by 48 inch poster printed on fabric and the quality is really nice. So let me hold our Spaceballs friends up here. You can see that it, it came out nice and clear and everything is perfectly readable and the fabric that it's printed on that Spoonflower recommends, I could ball this up and it won't get any wrinkles. It'll be, I can just take it out of my bag once I get to Orlando and bring it to the poster prep room and just put it together. See, I'm just gonna ball it up right now and put it on the other side of my table. But you can, these are just, these, you can see here, here's the poster all spread out on the floor. And then there it is all folded up. So that's also a possibility, especially if you're traveling to Orlando, that you might want to consider. Printing at Spoonflower, I 
I found a coupon code that let me get everything for $19, including shipping. But typically, it's, I think, $21 with shipping. And that is a lot cheaper than some places I've seen that do poster printing. So that might be an option. It's just print it on fabric, stick it in your suitcase, and bring it with you. That way, you don't risk losing your posters like I almost did. I didn't even make it through the Indianapolis airport because I live in, I live in Bloomington, Indiana. I didn't even make it through the Indianapolis airport without losing my poster box at least once. I didn't even get on the flight. I hadn't even made it anywhere near Seattle and I almost lost my poster box. So that's why I'm printing them on fabric this year. And it's a really neat option. And I'm glad I discovered this. I actually ordered this poster last week and I wasn't sure it was going to make it in time, but it got delivered this morning. So I ran home, grabbed it and brought it here for this afternoon session. So does anybody have any questions for me at this point? Anything that's popped up as I've finished up the presentation? Where do you start if you really stink at posters? Where do you start if you really stink at posters? My suggestion might be to look at some idea, look at some other posters that other people have made. Look, just even like, for example, Pinterest has lists of great research posters or just collections of research posters. And you could use some of those for a little bit of inspiration and then try and sketch something out. Say, okay, here's what I think I wanna do. And then, if you're having trouble in PowerPoint, if you're having trouble in whatever program that you're using to getting your vision to behave properly, it's there's no shame in asking for assistance. For example, um, I know that since my manager Michelle, since one of our um, one of our communication award submissions won an award. Um, she wants to put together a poster, but she doesn't have the time to. She's so busy doing all sorts of things for digital programs and uh, digital education programs and initiatives that she's having our communications department put together her poster. Mm -hmm. But even if it's just talking to a friend saying, okay, you've got some graphic design skills. Can you help me? Or even coming to me, like Lori, you could say, hey, Beth, can you help me with this? And I would say, sure thing. Now, hopefully not everybody who's making a poster descends upon me all at once and says, hey, Beth, help me with this. But I'm happy to help. I like helping. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't see any others. And we're just about to our time. Mm -hmm. Beth, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for all of the information. Oh, you've got more. Yep. Yep. The, this is the, I have two more slides left. This one okay. is just say, giving you the link. So um, I am going to put the links to how to get to creating research posters into that chat there. I'm not sure if it will make it to everybody, but I'm just going to post it into the chat here. And I'm going to try not to include all of my notes there. So let me see here. There it is. So it said to, yep. So um, the link that's on the screen will take you to a Canvas version of the course, which is structured in such a way to take you from beginning to end with making a research poster. Or if you just, if you have an idea of what you want to learn and just want to quickly review something, if you go to the second URL that it's in the list that I've shared, it's ittraining.iu.edu slash explore topics, titles, CRPOS, and I can we can send these out afterwards if need be. Mm -hmm. You can scroll through here, and here's the table of contents. You can just find what you need, which is very handy. And I'll have everybody know. I finished this, this I finished everything, the, this new version of the course last night just for you guys. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yep. And so thank you for everybody for coming today and have fun making posters and I'll see you all and your awesome posters at the conference. And if you have any questions or need design help, there's my email. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see you. We are down under two months until we're together in Orlando. And this recording will be made available on the SIGUX website and in YouTube next week. Thank you, Beth. 
Mm -hmm. You are very welcome. I'm happy to ramble about research posters anytime. <laughs> All right. Everybody have a great afternoon. Goodbye.